Business Chicago Portal Innovations and Illinois Fast Center at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign peers for helping to organize this fourth part of the series on SBIR funding. Great, thanks so much, Laura. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yes, your audio is great. <laughs> okay, fantastic. So, um, you know, Annalisa Samara here, um, you know, uh, fortunate to uh, um, uh, kind of, you know, go through this, um, you know, the last part of the of the four part series, I feel like in some ways, this is like a multi day conference, and we're on the last day here um, to talk about a really important uh, topic. And, and, and that's, you know, SBR, SCTR grant rejections. But before I go into the meat and potatoes of, of that very important topic, um, you know, for those of you who don't know me, um, just a, a little bit about myself. I've spent close to two decades working with early stage startups um, here in the Chicagoland area, wearing many hats, venture capital, tech transfer, and being a part of a number of um, you know, startups, primarily in the life sciences, um, wearing many hats uh, at the VP level. I'm currently the CEO and co-founder of a company called Reos uh, that spun out of uh, Northwestern University. Um, and in addition to uh, my job there in steering the ship, um, I give back to the entrepreneurial community um, just because I've been a part of it for so long uh, by way of um, SBR, STTR mentoring, um, you know, through, you know, opportunities like this where I get to, you know, chat with folks like you um, about um, you know as SBRs in general, but I also also mentor at um, you know groups like the Polsky Exchange, Chain Reaction Innovations, and I, and I serve um, as a as a uh, on the board and advisor of Women in Bio and and, 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 and Emma. Um, in terms of my grant successes, um, I've spent like I said, I've actually been working on grants since two thousand eight, um, and and it was. Uh, um, you know, I was working in VC at the time and it was an early stage fund and we didn't have a lot of money to put into our companies and my boss at the time said, hey, figure out SBR as a CTR, so I did. Um, took a while, uh, you know, but I did. Um, but, you know, since then, um, I've uh, uh, grown very uh, accustomed and comfortable with this funding mechanism through different agencies primarily NIH and NSF, but also DOD, what's not on here, DOE. Uh, I also work on a couple of NASA applications, um, you know, that sort of thing. And I've uh, served as a PI on multiple SBIRs. So, um, you know, through these experiences, you know, I say that non-diluted funding can be a company's best friend. And, um, you know, I, I come to you today as someone that's like you, um, you know, potentially who is, you know, has a startup and, you know, considering or have applied or are reapplying, um, you know, for the grant mechanisms. So, um, for those of you who didn't, uh, you know, attend the the last session, I'm going to go uh, do kind of a drive through version of what the SBR SCTR program is. Um, it is a set aside program um, where about two billion dollars a year is allocated just for U.S. based small businesses for. Um, for the development and eventual commercialization of new products and services um, that's based on innovative, unproven concepts uh, and technologies. And really, uh, the goal of the program is to stimulate technical innovation and to bring this innovation um, through commercialization, through you know, taxpayer dollars. Um, it also um, is, is, uh, is around to help uh, increase privacy private sector funding um, and to foster tech transfer, um, you know, through the STTR mechanism. So it is a multi-phase program. The, the dollars really vary uh, across the institutes, but, you know, in general, um, this multi-phase uh, program starts as a, you know, a feasibility, um, uh, you know, project in phase one that, you know, then kind of evolves into a, a larger full-scale R&D uh, program, which, you know, is a much longer research project. Um, and the dollars are larger. And then phase three, um, that's really commercialization. Um, there's typically no SBR, STTR funding at that phase, but depending on the institute, there may be some, um, you know, dollars through um, the institutes like the DOD who can serve as your commercial partner. But on average, it's a three to four year program that uses 
you know, other people's money. So that's the drive through version of um, SBRs, STTRs. Um, and then also, um, if there are questions, um, you know, you know, throughout the uh, presentation, um, you know, feel free to add them in the chat. And then, um, you know, Kathy or, or Laura can uh, interrupt me um, and, you know, ask the questions at that point. But I'll also reserve time at the end um, of my talk here um, to take you know, as many questions uh, as you throw at me, um, given our allotted time. So I will say that this talk has a, a large emphasis on the NIH. For those that are not applying to the NIH, there are still really, you know, relevant points um, that I'm going to be making that can be applicable to your agency. So I take a lot of the kind of the, you know, grants resubmission, um, you know, strategies that I have for NIH and, and NSF, and I apply it to DOD. Um, and you know the other institutes as well. So that's just kind of a you know uh, kind of a sneak peek uh, on um, you know what what's coming up in in the slides here. So you know I think rejection is um, re a really important topic. Um, you know I think just for startups in general, uh, I'm going to start off by saying that um, bringing in money into a startup in general, whether it's dilutive or non-dilutive is not easy. And for those of you who don't know what diluted funding is, that's typically your angel or venture capital money where you know, those, uh, those folks give you uh, money in exchange for a piece of the, uh, your equity pie, so part ownership in the company. Um, so diluted funding and non-dilutive funding um, you know, is, is very difficult to get. I think um, rejection is also difficult. Um, and uh, you might hear um, kind of the, you know, the cliche as you go through your um, startup journey that you really have to have thick skin. It's true. It's true. I think, uh, you know, I've gotten, you know, since, you know, working with startups, um, you know, since, you know, pre-2008, um, you know, in, in just raising money or applying for grants, I've gotten more rejections um, than awards, but, you know, I've definitely learned a lot along the way. And when those, you know, awards came, you know, those, those ended up being really instrumental um, in my company as we, um, you know, are trying to hit the next value inflection milestones or the next major milestone to attract um, you know, kind of uh, investor dollars. So, but, um, you know, rejection is, you know, an important part of, of the learning process. Um, and, you know, for these grants in particular, um, I'm not going to lie, it stings. It stings a little bit because, you know, you spend so much time putting these applications together. And then, you know, a couple months after you submit the application, you may log into the online portal and, you know, essentially see signs of rejection, um, you know, in your application. So, um, you know, I kind of just want to go through uh, this next slide here in terms of, you know, why grants typically, uh, you know, don't get funded. And I, and I think I showed this in one of the earlier talks and really, um, <clears throat> You know, it, it comes down to you know, uh, you know these bullets here primarily. Um, you know, the the first point is a lack of innovative ideas. So these funding agencies want to fund revolutionary, not evolutionary, so ideas. So not incremental improvements on existing technologies. So if you cannot excite the reviewers who are primarily researchers, um, you know, academic researchers are primarily the reviewers. If you cannot excite them. Um, on the research level, um, you know, that's, that's, you know, that's, that's going to result uh, typically in, uh, you know, an, an unfavorable result. Um, you know, the second point, uncertainty in con uh, concerning future directions. Um, I think when you put together your application, one thing that you should really think about, um, even if it's, you know, at the phase one level, but like what's phase two going to look like? You know, what's what is the work beyond phase two gonna, you know, gonna look like? They when the reviewers review your application and the institutes fund the applications, they're kind of in it for you know the the long haul, much like an investor, where you know they they put you know some you know amount of money in on, on the front end, but they're really uh, putting in money for the long-term goal, like your, your vision, that sort of thing. Um, you know, the, the next point um, that I want to make to you is like, you know, a lot of grants, um, 
um, tend to that that don't get funded um, tend to focus kind of their aims and overall research plan on more commercial activities than research. So it could be that the they have an aim that is you know solely working with um, you know a contract manufacturer to produce certain units or um, you know kind of like a marketing study. That's not really um, through the you know the reviewer's eye is really you know R and D. Um, and then, uh, you know, the next point, um, you know, an unfocused or superficial research plan, it, it could be just that um, you're not, you're kind of all over the place in terms of, you know, the project that you're trying to get funded. Um, and when you put together your, your research plan or project description, um, you know, you really have to, you know, be focused on the specific aims or objectives, and they have to be measurable um, and easy to, easy to grasp, um, you know, upon the initial uh, read. Um, the next bullet, um, poor success criteria, this is really important. I think if you were to walk away with one point out of this laundry list of points, it would be poor success criteria. And this is something that's important across all agencies. And it's also, I think, you know, an easy way to get a bad score. Um, so if you have a specific aim or a research objective and you don't have a measurable, a quantitative way to measure success, you 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 become a target um, because that's an easy way for a reviewer to say, I don't know how they're going to measure success. So my recommendation after you write an objective is to put what the quantitative success criteria is. So that's a, a pro tip there. Um, and then the you know the, the next two points, um, an over ambitious research plan. So you have um, you know typically for phase one that's anywhere between six months to twelve months. If you have a huge multi center study. Um, that's overly ambitious, obviously, but uh, like I said, these are reviewers uh, on the other end that are, are, you know, just your peers. So you want to present a research plan that is something that could be achieved uh, within the, you know, the given uh, time that you have on the project. And then finally, uh, you know, a weak team, that seems like kind of a generic statement, but, you know, the, the reviewers, um, like investors, are, are typically um, really looking at uh, the jockey in the race. They, they're looking at the PI, they're looking at the team that will be wor working with the PI to make sure that um, there are no gaps in um, talent, in resources that can successfully execute the project. So um, this is just kind of like, uh, just kind of the main points here in terms of um, you know, why, why grants are, are not uh, typically considered. Maybe I'll pause there to see if there's any questions. I can't open up the chat. Um, Annalisa, there is one question and great. it's from Gary. He's wondering, how does he determine whether a smaller government agency like Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement um, mm -hmm. has SBIR opportunities? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, if you go to, um, you know, SBIR.gov, that's kind of like the, the general um, SBIR website, um, you can let you know um, which institutes, agencies, um, agencies rather um, participate in, you know, the, the funding, um, you know, mechanism. Um, you know, I'm not, I'll be honest, I'm not really familiar uh, with that particular group, but, you know, my uh, kind of my the first place that I would visit is sbir.gov to see if that particular group participates in the funding mechanism. Great. All right, I'll keep going if there are no other questions. But, um, you know, next I kind of want to, you know, transition to kind of just my, my tips for, um, you know, survival and, and just kind of uh, how, kind of like, you know, uh, Laura said at the very beginning how you kind of take a rejection and, and use it as an opportunity. Um, and, uh, you know, like I said, you know, rejections, you know, they, they sting a lot. Um, and I, I worked with um, a lot of researchers, um, you know, on, on these grants who sometimes after the first time they do it, they don't want to do it anymore. <laughs> and I get it. I understand. I, it stings because you put you spend so much time in it. Um, you know, and it's a massive grant. Um, so even at the phase one level, if you if you look at the PDF um, you assemble it, that that could be anywhere between sixty pages on. So for you to not even get scored on that um, is not a great feeling. But um, you know, take it from someone who has gotten that not great feeling many times, um, and you know, kind of I've taken that feeling and use it as an advantage to just you know uh, put together a better application. I'm going to kind of walk through that. So 
I want to Lisa. Go, oh, sure. Just a just a point, and that is, I know we're talking primarily about NIH, but yeah. NS, NSF has a slightly different um, procedure now, and maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah, with yeah, the, yeah. With the rolling applications, so it's it's not yeah. quite as much work. Yeah, yeah, at yeah. At least yeah. initially. Yeah, yeah. So I will say, well, you know, my talk is primarily focused on NIH, and that is strategic because the NIH um, has, you know, kind of like this, um, like systematic way that you have to submit, do a resubmission. There's like an introduction to the application, that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, there's, there's, you know, uh, you know, three deadlines a year, um, you know, that, that sort of thing. Um, so I'll kind of walk through it. But for those of you who are in NSF land, I love the NSF. I'm going to start with that. Um, in terms of you know the resubmission, there is there's no introduction to you know the application page like the NIH. Um, and as Cynthia mentioned, kind of like the you know the, there's actually more um, you know submission windows uh, within the NSF, uh, which is great. Um, originally there were only a couple, but now it's kind of you know uh, you know every quarter uh, type thing for for the NSF. But if you were to uh, resubmit your NSF application, it cannot be in the same window in which you got the rejection. That's a very important point. It's got to go to the next one. So you have to go submit another project pitch uh, for those of you familiar with that, and then get an invite and then um, submit um, the grant. And you have to make substantial revisions to the application, and you have to note that in your application, kind of how um, you've, you've changed your application. Great. So, you know, kind of moving on here, um, you know, in terms of, you know, the, um, you know, uh, kind of just success rates, and this is just, you know, on, on the NIH side, um, you know, about a 12% success rate. This is just on recent data that I pulled yesterday, um, you know, off the uh, NIH website, you know, 12%. Um, for phase one, um, that jumps to 26%. That's no surprise because typically those that apply for phase two and successfully put it together, um, you know, they kind of uh, have have a better uh, understanding of their commercialization story, um, and uh, you know can kind of you know uh, and these folks are also uh, folks that receive phase ones or have are far far along to go straight to to phase two. So that jumps. And then uh, fast track for those who are applying for phase one and phase two at the same time, it's about a 17% um, you know, success rate. Um, and you know, these applications, whether you go for the NIH, NSF, DOD, DOE, or, or et cetera, um, the su success rates, you know, um, they drop because uh, there's so many more apl applicants every year, um, you know, through because of awareness through things like this, um, through folks that um, kind of have the startup bug that, um, you know, don't want to raise dilutive financing initially, they go uh, for, you know, these grant opportunities, and that's, that's totally fine. So I want to show you this screenshot. This is an actual screenshot from the portal in which you kind of see your list of grants. Um, so this is mine for my company, and uh, this is, I think, just maybe one screen. So um, you know, uh, it's, it's one of these situations where, um, you know, I had, you know, multiple, multiple, um, you know, applications in, and I have, you know, one here that's awarded. This is not uncommon. Um, you know, even, especially like in academia, I was actually talking to someone over, a, a researcher over at the Mayo Clinic who said he submitted 10 R01s last year and got one. Right, that's a lot of R ones for those of you who are familiar with R ones, but that just kind of goes to show you have to have that you know perseverance in order for you to even get one award. The same thing can be said as you pitch to investors, angel investors, VCs. Um, you know, don't expect to get the funding the first time around. So, um, you know, to get you know kind of forwarding um, you know screens within uh, you know e comments for those of you at NIH, you know, you'll see it kind of a screen like this. This is a lucky individual, uh, whoever Kirk is, got a score of uh, you know 28, and it looks like the application is awarded. So good for you know him. That's fantastic. Um, in terms of scoring in the NIH, um, you know the lower the score, the better. Um, you know that's kind of how it works. So th th these are kind of general points. So if you're less than 20, you have a pretty good chance of get, getting funded, but it's again, institution specific, depending on pay lines, budgets, that sort of thing. If you are scored, you are in the top half of the applicant pool. If you're not, 
you're in the lower half, that's okay. I've been in the lower half many times. It's okay, you can get out. Um, and for those of you who do get scored and it's above a 40, I'm not saying that it's not uh, impossible, um, but it's not really likely that you'll get funded. Uh, but again, each institute has their own pay line and zone of consideration. So um, then there's also this screen that you may see in eCommons where something might not be discussed. Um, it, this is not a fun screen to see. Uh, you know, when you log in, you get this, you kind of go through this uh, reaction roller coaster where you're angry, disappointed, um, you know, feel despair and then grief. But, you know, that's okay. Even though I've done this so many times, I've lost count of how many grants that I've submitted since 2008. I, I go through the same roller coaster each time. And that's okay because uh, you have to go through those emotions in order to clear your head so you can come back um, and resubmit the application. Um, here's kind of a, a screenshot of, you know, kind of the, the scoring. Typically, the NIH, you have three reviewers. Um, the lower the score, the better. They, they, they score anywhere between one to nine. Um, and I kind of, you know, have, a, you know, a good situation on the left and a bad situation on the right, um, where in red are, you know, kind of the things that, you know, I would, um, you know, kind of focus on in terms of your uh, resubmission. So the way that the reviewers uh, kind of look at the, you know, review the grants is in, you know, these major categories, significance, uh, the investigator, innovation, approach, and environment, and, you know, they score, um, you know, uh, you know, per those sections. Um, and then at the, at the end of, you know, their, you know, the scoring, then they, they kind of come, uh, come back with the impact score. So the immediate next steps, and this is kind of just general to all agencies, whether it's NIH or not. First of all, don't take the rejection personally. Um, you know, I used to do that. I used to say they were, they don't get it. They don't like this condition that um, you know I'm addressing. You know, so for instance, for my company, we're our initial. Um, clinical uh, market that we're addressing is the hydrocephalus. I used to say the NIH doesn't want to, uh, you know, fund hydrocephalus. They don't even like it. Those are the feelings I had. Um, but that's okay, and it's okay to vent, um, you know, and it, especially to vent to someone that has gone through it, um, and uh, you know, uh, just kind of, just kind of, you know, get you focused so that you can submit the next application. Um, the third point is a very important point: do not contact the program officer right away. I wouldn't do it the day that you get. A not discussed or really bad score. Um, you know, I would at least sleep on that and the next day, you know, contact that person because you're you're gonna contact the program officer. And, you know, I think, you know, kind of like those emotions of, you know, anger might come out. Um, I know some um, you know, some companies that uh, you know, uh, kind of through um, you know, the ecosystem that have done that and have talked to the program officer, you know, with anger. Um, I wouldn't do that because you know these these are the folks that you want to build that relationship with, um, especially for those that are applying for NSF DoD because you know you know those folks are you know highly influential on the outcome of your proposal. So you want to you want to develop that strong relationship very early so that you can get funded potentially for phase one, phase two, and other grants. Um, and then the other, you know, thing that you need to do immediately is to look at the next grant deadline. Um, I know that's hard to kind of, you know, bounce back right away, but, you know, for if you want to, you know, get funding sooner, you should really look at the next grant submission deadlines. Um, so, for instance, with the with the NIH, um, sometimes that stings because you'll get your summary statement, your review. Uh, two weeks before um, you know the next deadline. Can you can you um, technically submit within that window? Yeah, you could. You can't you can't submit without um, you know your reviews reviews for for the NIH. Um, and then, kind of just the, the process to the resubmission. Actually, maybe I'm going to stop there. Are, were there any questions on that? We had I actually had a question, and that was about. Um, NSF scoring, and I don't know if that's something that you oh, can speak to this morning. Yeah, 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 that's great. So um, the NIH, as I showed you, has like quantitative scoring, and then the NSF has more qualitative scoring. So I'm an NSF reviewer, um, and you know the way that we 
review the applications is, you know, it's kind of, you know, range, it ranges from, uh, you know, poor to excellent or outstanding. Um, and, you know, we, we you know, uh, base it on, you know, similar categories, you know, to the NIH kind of, you know, the, the team, the research, you know, that, that sort of thing. So the way that we review is that, you know, we get the applications in advance, of course, um, and, uh, you know, we, uh, you know, fill out, uh, you know, forms online, um, just kind of, you know, uh, you know, kind of our, our feedback per the, you know, kind of the review criteria, and then we discuss it as a group, um, kind of, you know, where the application should land in terms of, you know, should it move on, it, where it goes, kind of goes back to, you know, the program director to ultimately decide. So um, while it's not as quantitative as the NIH, um, you know, you know, it, it, it's, um, you know, there is you know, scoring that's more qualitative from poor to, you know, excellence. And like I said, we, we, we do the reviews individually, then discuss it as a group. That review gets sent to the program director she or he makes the ultimate decision. That's how that works. We have one more question, Annalisa. Sure. Yeah, and let's, let's go for it. Um, yeah, this is um, someone wondering if there are resources for successful application examples or templates. Yeah, yeah, you know what? There used to not be. Um, but I've seen online, um, you know, particularly, um, you know, on the NIH website, I've seen different institutes post um, successful and unsuccessful grant submissions, not only for STTRs, but even for some of the other R mechanisms. I've also seen some NSF, uh, you know, grants floating around in the internet, but not on the NSF website. Um, the NSF is pretty particular about that. Um, you know, at least you know when I when I checked a couple of weeks ago, I didn't see any, you know, funded applications. But what you can see is the abstract. So how the NSF is structured, it's it's as opposed to the NIH, it's, it's structured by topic area. You can see. The, their portfolio companies. Um, you can see the projects, um, you know, that they, they funded, um, you know, within their portfolios. And then you can also look up, um, you know, all the awards, you know, ever for um, NSF, SVR, STTRs, and kind of, you know, look at, you know, the abstracts, um, you know, that sort of thing. I think that's helpful, you know, um, uh, even if you saw a full application, I wouldn't necessarily copy the structure because, you know, um, you know, all applications are, you know, kind of have their own flair, but um, I think if you're able to find one online to the NSF, that's great, but you won't find it um, on the NSF um, website. Thank you. Sure. All right, so kind of moving on here, um, you know, just uh, you know, back kind of to the NIH. So uh, your reviews come through, um, come in a summary statement, and then you know, as you review, uh, as you look through your reviews, there's really two questions you should ask, and that is, you know, are you know, are the problems that they see are they fixable or are they not? And the other question is, you know, um, was it reviewed by the right study section? So. Um, in the NIH, um, you know, you may want to target your grant to a particular institute, like the National Cancer Institute, for instance, but it has to go through a study section that actually reviews the grant. You can make a recommendation um, of which study section should review the grant. So there's a listing uh, on the NIH SBR website that you know, takes you to a link that lists all the study sections, and you can make a suggestion, but it, the NIH ultimately decides. In NSF land, you have to, um, you know, list your topic area. So there is, you know, quite a variety of topic areas, you know, within, um, you know, the NSF, and you have to list which topic area that your um, grant belongs to, and then it will go to that, you know, particular group. Um, but it's 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 pretty broad. So there's, you know, um, you know, digital health or you know, um, semiconductors that sort of thing. So you have to make sure that it's going to um, the right topic area. And then, you know, I think the other important point that I want to make in terms of the summary statement back to the um, NSF is that you know one of the biggest things, um, uh, you know, in terms of the review is um, you know getting the reviewer to um, you know be on board with the significance of the problem that you're trying to address because that is the first section in the research plan that they review it's the significance 
um, if you can't capture them, if you can't draw them in, in the significance, then it's kind of like, it goes downhill after that. So it's, it's critical. And I tell this to everybody, even in the NSF land, where um, you, know, you put together your project description, you have to give a reason for people to keep on reading, um, where I would put in some facts. I would make things quantitative, like how big is the problem in terms of dollars? How big is the problem in terms of the population affected? Um, and who you know, are the, you know, the end users and what are the pain points? Because I think if you say, state the pain and can quantify it at the get-go, that grabs people as people's attentions and wants and gets them to want to read more. And if you can't do that in a significance section, which is the first section of most grants, then it's, it's, it's likely you're going to lose them um, for the rest of the um, application. So here's some you know common you know fixable problems. I kind of kind of want to transition to this as as um, you know you consider um, you know resubmission. Um, you know the you know. Uh, if you didn't have a lot of time um, to put together your application, um, you know, it's probably not written well. So that, you know, issues like that formatting presentation, that's easy, right? Um, you have, you know, more time to, um, you know, put that together, give it to someone uh, as a second set of eyes. Um, the other problem is um, that you're missing some, um, you know, information, um, or maybe you didn't even have the information. So you may have had um, some preliminary data that um, you were able to gather from the time of um, you know submission to the next window, um, you know you know you can add that um, in your next um, in your next go around. Um, I will say sometimes agencies like um, the NIH and NSF and others will allow you to submit additional information post submission, and that's like you need to get an email. Um, I wouldn't voluntarily send information to the program officer or program director or the contracting officer, whoever, um, as you're, you know, because, you know, you, you want to let them know of all the good stuff that has happened since submission. You have, you should wait until you're allowed to submit that. Um, and then the next problem, the significance, I kind of talked about that in, in the next, in the previous slide where that is important not only in the research plan and the project description for NSF, but you know, before reviewers even get to that, they're looking at the specific aims page, the abstract, um, and kind of the summary of the application like in, in the NSF. You really, you, get, you gotta get them in terms of the problem. You have to paint a picture that this is a big deal, that, um, that this is important, an important area of science and public health, and you need to quantify that. I, I guess I can't, I can't say that enough. Um, and then other kind of fixable problems. Um, so I have here research not shown to be feasible by the proposed personnel. So in a couple slides ago, I said weak team. So one of the easy targets for reviewers is to look at the entire team and to identify gaps. I see this all the time. So in previous applications, I used to get cheap reviewer shots where no biostatistician on the team or no whoever, radiologist, you know, for instance, that, that sort of thing. These reviewers are looking for gaps in the personnel. So as you put together your application, you think about that. You think about, you know, all of your objectives, all of your aims, who's going to do it, um, who's going to review it, who's going to analyze data, make sure that you have, you know, um, personnel to, to cover all of that, whether it's employees, consultants, subcontractors, that sort of thing. Um, the other problem that is fixable, I, I discussed this on a previous slide, but I think it's worth mentioning again, is that um, you know, the reviewers with each objective and aim at any institute, DOE, DOD, it doesn't matter, that it's important that you discuss what the potential pitfalls, obstacles are, and what and how you're going to get out of it, um, uh, you know, or a present or, or presentation of alternative approaches. That you know, I've, I've seen, you know, uh, as an applicant and as a reviewer, I like seeing that because um, you're also um, kind of, um, you know, uh, preventing attack, <laughs> you know, I like, I think that's, I think that's a good way to put it, where, um, you know, these are the things that can go wrong. And if they do go wrong, this is what I'm going to do. They like seeing that. Um, so, um, you know, like science, everything doesn't go uh, right the first time around. Uh, any questions on uh, kind of these common fixable problems before I go on? Nope. Okay, I'm gonna keep going. 
Um, so hard to fix problems um, in any application. Um, so low impact research topic. So it's not that um, the, the problem that you're addressing is not significant. It's that your technology, the reviewers feel won't have an impact on the field. So reviewers want to see game changing a revolu not evolutionary, revolutionary technology that is going to have a significant impact in the science that you're in. So you really have to sell that in your application and back it up with, um, with references. Um, and then there's some philosophical issues that reviewers have in terms of they just don't they just don't feel like the work is important. They may be, they're, they're, these are likely experts in the field and they just don't feel like your, your work is gonna move the needle um, again. So you'd have to really sell your technology uh, at the get-go. Um, you know, when you, when, you, when you state the problem at the very beginning and you introduce your solution, you really have to sell the gap that you're filling. Um, and then finally, um, you know, if these are experts in, in your field that are reviewing your application and they are aware of other um, other technologies um, and, and they feel like it's too similar, um, that's kind of a, you know, um, and if it is, that's kind of a hard to fix problem. Um, but you have an opportunity in any grant application to really describe the innovation. Like why is your work innovative in terms of, is it protectable patent wise? Um, you, know, uh, you, know, you know, what are the advantages that your technology has over others? I think what would be good um, if you have technology that is similar to others is to really have a competitive analysis table. I, you know, I, I review so many applications and I don't see this even in the, in the phase one level, I would just put it in there because you, you might have a reviewer that is aware of another technology, whether it's commercialized or even on the academic side, like address it, put it in a table. All right. So, um, Annalisa, we do yeah. have, a uh, quick question, and I think actually you're, you may be getting to it, but that is how important is the PI profile? The PI profile is the most, well, I'm going to start off saying the PI is the most important person on the grant. This is the um, captain of the ship. So the profile should really um, demonstrate a couple of things. And uh, first and foremost is a demonstration of uh, leadership. So um, and leadership and um, successful execution of a project. So um, you don't necessarily have to have a PhD or MD to be a PI and a grant. I'm a PI, I have neither of those degrees, but um, I've demonstrated leadership in terms of successfully executing um, certain projects, whether it's a regulatory approval in the US or Europe or a successful completion of a multi-center pivotal trial published work, that sort of thing. Um, so a really stellar bio sketch um, has to demonstrate leadership and you need to provide those examples um, that you have the technical background um, to um, lead the science. And, um, you know, I think uh, just, uh, you know, references in terms of, you know, published papers, uh, abstracts, um, patents, that that's also you know uh, key too. So as you put together your bio sketches in any institute, you want to make sure that you're following the guidelines, um, and they tend to change. Um, so the bio sketch for you know the NIH, for instance, you know has has changed you know recently. So you want to make sure that you're following the rules on that. Great. I think there was uh, someone who raised their hand. Or yeah, Dennis has raised his hand. Dennis, if you want to unmute. Sure. Uh, thank you. So my question is, um, what if, so like in my case, I, I have a startup and I have a technical background, so I have a PhD, but I'm the only one on my team with a technical background. So I would be the only kind of like verified uh, PI or person with any applicable talent to kind of verify the solution. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Or would it be a good idea to uh, try and pull more people into the team, more PhDs or more people with a technical background? Yeah, I think it depends on the, um, the specific aims or objectives you're proposing. Um, so it's not believable for you to do the entire, the entire thing. Um, run all experiments, even though if you technically can, other uh, viewers are not going to be comfortable with that. 
because um, you know the, they have the impression that you're doing other things within the company too. My suggestion would be, you know, if you and, and these other folks on your, your company are they more kind of on on the business side, whether it's marketing or sales? Is that what the situation is? So currently, uh, I, I'm doing, or I'm I'm driving the research. I have a few interns, and I have um, a few colleagues who are helping out, but. Really, yeah. it's, it's a very small company, so uh, it's it doesn't really have too many people. So that's my concern: is not okay. having enough people to appear. Yeah, legitimate. sure. I understand the concern. So uh, obviously, the best situation is if you had you know more technical people on the team at the time of award. Um, but I'm going to stress that at the time of award part. So you know what you can do also is you know add other senior personnel to the grant um you know and these could be folks that are willing to be part of the project at the time of award so if you can grab their bio sketches um and uh you know if they, you know they would be comfortable with you know uh, you know uh that being uploaded to the you know application to fill any technical gaps um you know that that would be good um and it is you know, understandable if the personnel, the 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 non PI, uh, you know, the personnel change um, at the time of award because it takes such a long time to get the award. You know, uh, most cases about six months, and you know, people get jobs or lose interest, that sort of thing, and that's understandable. But you know, my tip would be that um, you know you would have you know bio sketches for other folks that you could add to the team who would be willing to join if the grant is awarded because it goes to show that you know which um, skill sets you're looking for to achieve certain goals within the objectives. In addition to personnel, um, and you don't have to have like, you know, a ton of these folks, it could be, you know, one or two other senior personnel, you can have, um, you know, non key personnel, key personnel or other, or personnel, other personnel, personnel, however, it's coined, um, you know, per agency where you don't have to name um, um, the individuals, you can just say, you know, research technician, or, you know, whatever the title is, you don't have to provide a bio sketch. Um, but that also shows that you know that you're, you know, that you you need these folks to, you know, uh, achieve your research goals. Um, the other thing that I would add to is you may want to add some consultants, um, you know, to the application too. Um, if you know, in the statistician example, you might want to add, you know, that folks for status for consultants, they add their bio sketches to the application. So that would help, you know, kind of beef up the team and um, kind of balance it out uh, in case there are gaps. Okay, so the takeaway is the more the merrier. Yeah, well, I think to an extent, yeah, just I think generally the more the merrier on the technical side because you want to show strength in the technical team. It is not believable that all the technical experiments will lie on the shoulders of one individual. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Sure thing, sure thing. Annalisa, we have a request to ask another question. Sure. Um, do you would you like to do that now or wait until oh, closer we can do to the it end? Now. We can do okay. it now. All right, Gary, if you would like to unmute and ask your question. Annalise, uh, we are just finishing the phase two of a, a dual National Labs CRADA where we had Lawrence Livermore and Argonne both on the single CRADA. Um, they recommended that we look at an SBR, they being the head of the program, the program director at Lawrence Livermore. Um, mm -hmm. and. Uh, but she didn't give any suggestions. Is it permissible to get references or letters of support or anything like that? Uh, because it's been a very successful um, CRADA, but uh, um, it, the SBR is kind of a new game and I've never done that. Oh, I see, I see. So your current funding agency is is, is asking you to um, look at other funding opportunities. To help. Right, they only do a phase one and phase two. I see, I see, I see, I see, I see. Um, and you're wondering, um, you know, kind of uh, where to get letters of recommendation. She seemed very positive, and I'm oh, wondering, is it is it permissive? Is, mm, is yeah. it a protocol mistake to go back and say, Robin, would you write us a letter of reference to the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement or something, or, like or that? whichever whichever agency, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, um, so depending on the agency, um, you know, there are limits to letters of support. So let's say that you went to the NSF. For example, mm -hmm. um, for phase one, uh, there's a three letter limit. And for phase two, there's a five letter limit. So, 
you know, if, you know, typically in those letters of support, I would, I would, you know, suggest that you get some, a letter from, you know, a current or potential investor, a uh, current or potential uh, customer slash um, strategic partner, um, and then maybe another letter from a collaborator for phase two. If you have an open slot and you want to do NSF, I would get a letter from this, you know, particular agency. If there are other agencies that you're looking at where, you know, there is, you know, seemingly no limit, um, I would say it's okay to get, you know, this type of letter because it shows that, you know, you have successfully not only gotten um, research funding for your business, but you've completed the project successfully. I think that's key for multiple awards that you, you only get multiple awards, you know, uh, if that confidence is there that you have successfully completed the project. Yeah, yeah. And also uh, make sure that um, if you do apply for, you know, at another agency, obviously the, the objectives cannot overlap. That needs to be clear, uh, whether in the letter or in the body of the of the research. Let me ask a clarifying question. Do you yeah. mean that we have to write in our application why this uh, proposal stands on its own vis-a-vis -vis yes. the creative? Yeah, that why okay. why this Good. new proposal is independent of that because you can't because that's that's also federal funding and you can't get the um, you know um, no more, double dipping. That's that's it. That's it. I was looking for my cup of coffee and then you said it for me. So thank you for saving me. <laughs> Great, and good luck on that. Great, any other questions um, before I go on? No, go ahead. Great, these are these are really great questions here. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna I'm kind of zip through the rest of the slides so then I can um, you know, uh, open the floor to even more questions. So you know, these are hard to fix problems. Um, just kind of moving on here. Oh, contacting your program officer. So I said, don't, don't contact the program officer right away because you're gonna you know, say, you might say things that you're gonna regret later. Um, so these are the things that I would do if you were to contact your program officer. Um, first of all, and this is, I don't even know if this is on here. D don't ask like, what went wrong? You know, why, why didn't they like it? I, I, would, I would kind of, you know, ask, you know, um, you know, things about, uh, you know, what are the potential pay lines or the funding range of consideration? If you ask about a pay line, you might get a response that says, oh, we don't even, we don't know our pay line. Um, and then right away say, well, do you have a funding range of consideration? And if they say they don't know, you say, well, historically, what has been the funding range of consideration uh, been? So you can, sometimes they post these things on, online, sometimes they don't, but, you know, I would, I would ask just to see if it's, you know, kind of worth resubmitting um, your application. Um, and then also, you know, you should really look at your program officer to help you understand the reviews and give you insights, um, you know, on the meeting. So um, it, you know, don't expect the uh, program officer to remember all the details of what happened during the review because, you know, there's a lot of applications that, you know, they, they review. So that's not the goal of the call. The goal is really to, to get them to interpret the summary statement, your reviews, and to give you advice based on that. Um, and then going back to the point that I made earlier, you want to build this relationship with your program officer, even if you're angry because you got a bad score or not rejected. Um, this is going to be the hand that feeds you grant dollars, right? So you want to, you know, come in with an open mind, come in with, um, come in with that mindset that you are coachable. Um, and I, you know, I say that even in terms of, you know, if you're seeking, you know, kind of, um, you know, uh, getting advisors or, um, you know, uh, seeking investment dollars that you are open to be taught. So that's how your uh, you know, push should be. Um, so it's just go in for general kind of, uh, you know, advice. Um, and then finally, if you want to get kind of, um, you know, more specific advice, more technical advice, that's when you go to your colleagues to get, um, you know, their take on the critiques because they might be seeing things differently than you. Um, and then for this is, you know, kind of uh, more specific to NIH or maybe other institutes that allow kind of a response. This is this is typical, um, you know, template that I like to use uh, where, you know, I it's a, a one pager where I, you know, I think the reviewers for, um, you know, their insightful comments, that sort of thing, then I kind of go into specific points and how we address it. Um, so, you know, for the NIH in particular, there's only, you know, one page limit. So it has to be really tight. So um, these are, you know, brief sentences um, and or you can point to pages uh, in which um, you address the concerns. Um, and then finally, this is this is for all agencies. If you um, you know if you do decide to you know resubmit, 
and are, you know, uh, largely using a lot of, uh, you know, past material from the original application. These are the things that I, you know, recommend that you, you know, do a once or twice over before you hit submit. Bio sketches, there may have been updates, there may have been a new paper or new patent or change in personnel, make sure that um, you check that. Also check the, you know, the bio sketch format to make sure it's the most current one they're using. The budgets, that's a, you know, that's a, that's a, that's one too that's often overlooked during a kind of a resubmission. Make sure that the dates make sense. That's not going to, in my experience, it hasn't tanked an application. It might be irritating to the reviewer because you didn't change it because you forgot. Um, so change the start and end dates. Um, also make sure that the costs are, you know, uh, for certain materials and salaries, um, you know, make any changes, that sort of thing. And the commercialization plan, at, you know, if you're a phase two applicant, whatever agency you're at, you want to show growth since the last submission. Um, I think this is really important, not only in the commercialization plan, but also in the facilities page too. You want to say, you know, um, and this is what I do, um, you know, at the, in the facilities page or at the start of the commercialization plan, I have a kind of a snapshot of since the last submission, the company has done, and I have bullets, boom, 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 depending on category, you know, uh, like intellectual property, as I'll say, you know, um, you know, received notice of allowance, that's huge news, or like a fundraising, uh, you know, uh, you know, received a $10,000 grant, uh, that sort of thing. I would hit them with some good stuff at the front end. That's just a, a tip because that will say, oh, this company really, you know, did a lot of things since uh, the last submission, you know, at least on the, I'm, I'm more of the commercial business front. Um, and then also in the final checklist, you want to go through your letters of support to make sure that they're still relevant. Um, I would, um, you know, if you can, uh, you know, get updated, um, you know, dates, that sort of thing. It's, it's kind of hard sometimes because you don't want to, you know, bother these folks that are giving you the letters of support. If you can, um, you know, update, um, you know, those dates, uh, add letters or switch them out uh, as needed. And then uh, for your research strategy, if you were able to get new data or, you know, there's published research uh, in the field, you know, you might want to add that to the research strategy and then references you know, just do once over on that to make sure that the, the numbers and everything match up. I will say in a couple of reviews, you know, you think that their viewers might not look at the references. I've had a couple, you know, uh, summary statements where they say, you know, you know, this paper, you know, didn't match up this or didn't match up to, you know, the fact or, you know, the kind of the statement that you made in the body of the application. So they may check you. Uh, it doesn't happen often, or at least in my experience, but it's happened a few times. Um, and then finally, kind of before we, you know, we, we're kind of wrapping up here, um, I, I will say that, um, you know, uh, like all types of fundraising, whether it's dilutive or non-dilutive, um, you know, it, 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 it seems that, you know, the you know, failed applications are inevitable. It, it happens, um, happens a lot, but, you know, the perseverance, your, you know, ability, ability to be like Phoenix rising from the ashes can, you know, pay dividends. So I remember I was in one company one time and I was working with this, um, uh, you know, this physics professor on a grant and he, you know, we, we put so much time and effort in this $2.3 million grant. And then, you know, we got rejected the first time and he's just like, I'm done with the NIH. I don't want to do it anymore. Um, but, you know, we convinced him that, you know, this is what we get, you know, we have to, you know, keep going. So, you know, the, the next time around, um, you know, we made the application a lot better um, and got that grant. So that was a you know, huge deal to the company. So, um, maybe I'm going to pause right there. Uh, I know we have about, you know, five, six minutes left, um, you know, to see if there are any questions. Um, yeah. I don't see any more questions yet, Annalisa, but if anyone does, feel free to raise your hand or put it in the chat. And I did just want to, you know, reemphasize what you, um, what you just said. I listened to an excellent podcast yesterday, um, Guy Raz with um, Max Levchin. And I know this is not NIH related, but just to reiterate the number of times that he had to go, had to, you know, get in front of, of people for funding. And I mean, even somebody, you know, as brilliant as that uh, really had a difficult time needed to put a team together because he was not good in front of investors himself. He was very awkward. Um, so had to get a great CEO, but just had to constantly work and work and work and work. And you can't expect success the first time around. 
Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. Um, I, it, you know, it's true. I will say even on um, just trying to raise money from angels and VCs, I, honestly, for my current company, I can't tell you how many times uh, I pitched. I, I don't even remember. Um, but um, I, I know that, you know, it's just, you know, funding doesn't come the first time around, but you get better each time because you get that feedback. And I always say that no grant effort is ever wasted because you can turn that into another application. Um, you can use that material for a pitch competition, um, you know, that, that sort of thing. Um, and um, also I would, you know, maybe try a different agency. So, um, you know, a couple of companies ago, uh, I, we never got an NIH grant, but the NSF loved us. Same technology, but it just resonated, um, you know, with that particular agency more. Great. Uh, I don't know if there's any questions. It's about, yeah, letters I, of support. Could I ask, oh, is there a question? Yeah, we've got okay, one question go and, the, and then it can be your turn, Gary. So Ali has asked, what is your experience on updating letters of support? Can you use the same letters over again and just change the dates? Um, he's concerned about getting pushback from people um, yeah. signing on, you know, and going to people over and over again. Yeah, you know, I think that's a, that's a, that's a delicate topic, right? Because, you know, these folks, they're doing you a favor. They don't have to give you a letter of support. They were kind enough to give it to you the first time around. If they can give you an updated, uh, you know, letter with a date, great. If you feel like they wouldn't, then just just don't, because if the letter is strong enough, the content is what matters. Um, you know, I, I would just go with that. I mean, most of the time when I do my, uh, you know, grant resubmissions, um, you know, I tend to, you know, use, uh, you know, the same letters, as long as it's relevant, um, that, you know, the, the particular, uh, you know, research area still matches up um, to what I'm proposing in the grant. Um, so it's not fatal. Uh, at least in my experience, uh, that if you, you know, reuse a letter that is unchanged. Um, Gary, would you like to go ahead with your question? Sure. My question um, jumps off of a point that you made earlier, which is that you need to be persistent sometimes to win on these. So mm -hmm. we won um, a big grant, um, two grants, each $300,000, and we Good. had to put up our 400. So it's a million dollar project. That's a big deal. We yeah. had been rejected five times before yeah. um, on different technologies. And so we were pretty discouraged and it yeah. probably put close to half a million dollars into those five because they were big yeah. grants or big proposals. And in one of them, and this is the essence of my question, three reviewers were um, polled. Two of them gave us A plus. This is DOE in, in this case. Mm -hmm. um, the third one said, I give them F and if I could give them a lower score, I would. And then named a whole bunch of things which are <laughs> absolutely ludicrous. Well, one of the reviewers called us and said, guys, I didn't want you to be too discouraged. Um, it's got to be a, a competitor that you hit there. Yeah. Because, you know, and how do they avoid that in the yeah. DOE? Yeah, you know, that, that's tough. Um, not all agencies, um, you know, um, you know, uh, list the the study section rosters. Um, so, you know, NIH is good where you, you know, the, the study section rosters are listed. You see the names, the institutes, their titles, all that. It's all there. Um, but you don't know which one actually you read your grant. Um, you know, I think in the case where you don't get to see um, it, you know, I would, uh, you know, make the request as long as the opportunity is available that reviewer number three be excluded from their view because of these reasons, that, you know, and it, it doesn't hurt to try that. I've done that before, actually, and I know a lot of companies that have done that where, you know, this, you know, uh, so-and-so could be a competitor, um, that, um, that, that, that just the, the we're looking for this particular background and you feel based on the reviews that his or her skill sets um, don't, you know, don't line up to the application. Yeah, but congratulations on the other grants that you got. Uh, that's that, that's a, uh, you know, that's a uh, reason to celebrate, um, certainly. Thank you. Uh, we had a question from Robert and he's wondering, um, if you could describe pitching a proposal. So can you do that to a program officer yeah. ahead of, yeah, ahead of application? Yeah, it depends on the institute. So, um, you know, the NSF has a formal project pitch. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure if you're, you know, considering um, the NSF, but there's a, you can do it today if you wanted to, where, um, you know, there's certain fields of questions where you describe the objectives, the technology, the team, that sort of thing. And they're, you know, kind of short answer fields. And then, 
um, that is that is kind of a written pitch, and then that gets reviewed, and then you know if there's a thumbs up, you get an invitation to apply. Uh, you know, other agencies, you, you don't have that opportunity. Um, you may have to contact, um, you know, the program officer to see if this is an area of interest. So what I wouldn't do is I, I wouldn't send a ton of information to that institute. Um, I wouldn't, if you want to send something, send maybe a couple of bullets. So it's a quick read. Uh, it's unlikely they'll read like a full document, um, you know, NIH, you know, DOD, that sort of thing um, to kind of, you know, kind of get their uh, feedback if this is something that they would be interested in. And then there's some institutes like the DOD where there's a window in which you can ask questions. So be very mindful of that. I know that one company that, you know, tried contacting a contracting officer outside of that window, you know, that that wasn't a great situation. So, you know, be mindful of the kind of, um, you know, the opportunities to connect there. Great advice. Great. Well, I know we're thank over you. time here, um, but I just want to say thank you so much for the opportunity uh, for, uh, you know, to have the discussion about, um, you know, uh, you know, something that should be talked about more and that's, uh, you know, rejections. Uh, you know, it's, it's not always rosy, but, you know, it's something that you can, you know, definitely learn from. Um, thank you so much, Annalisa. Thank you to the FAST Center of Illinois at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign um, campus and to Portal Innovation and to World Business Chicago. Um, really, this has been a tremendous series. We've had excellent attendance and the content has just been outstanding. And we will definitely do this again. So be on the lookout for announcements through the Illinois FAST Center. Um, as well as the uh, UIC Innovation website too. Please do register for our newsletter. Um, and best of luck to everyone in the future. Please do 